Bibles and turn, if you would, to the 17th chapter of the book of Exodus for our text for the morning. The children of Israel have left slavery in Egypt and they're making their way to the land of promise. And we catch up with them here in Exodus chapter 17. And I'll begin reading at the first verse. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, from there for, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They're almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you, Take in your hand the staff from which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the light of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? This is the Word of God. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. During the season of Lent, it is typical for the Christian community to look at some of these texts in the Bible, such as the one I read to a few moments ago, that paints a picture of what it means to be on a journey with God. During the season of Lent, we are reminding ourselves that we are on a journey. We're on a Lenten journey to draw closer to Jesus Christ, but beyond that, we are a pilgrim people, always on a journey in this world. We are a pilgrim people making our journey back home. The text that we use frequently during the season of Lent reminds us that we are not called to be settlers. We're called to be pilgrims. We're not called to circle the wagons and enjoy our comfort zone, but we are encouraged to continue being aliens in this world as we make our pilgrimage deeper and deeper into God, as we make our pilgrimage closer and closer to home. We are those people in the world, the people of Jesus Christ, who teach the world around us what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. We're the people that teach the rest of the world around us what it means to trust God, to trust God to the extent that we can take risk throughout life, that we can attempt audacious things for God, knowing that God will be good. God is always good in our lives and toward us. Here at Wesley Memorial, we have a long history of being willing to take risk, to walk by faith and not by sight. I can't imagine how difficult it would have been 50 to 60 years ago when our congregation was downtown on Main Street and the congregation went through the decision-making process of determining that they would move away from downtown and they'd come out here on Chestnut Drive and they would build this beautiful facility. I'm sure that was not an easy decision. That was not an easy time in the life of the congregation. 
I'm sure that there was a great deal of angst surrounding that decision that led up to that congregational vote as to what they would do. And there in that time, in that season, they made the decision to step out in faith, to take a risk, to go where they had never gone before in their attempt to be faithful to God. I, I hear a lot of stories about how almost 20 years ago this congregation went through that program that was called God's Future Church. And the congregation made their way to that decision where they raised an enormous sum of money to renovate this campus, to refurbish this campus, and in the midst of that great money-raising endeavor, they raised money to create the Macedonia Family Resource Center, which continues to change lives there in that community here in High Point. We are those people who show the rest of the world how to trust. We are those people who show the rest of the world who who do not know the peace of Christ, what it means to be possessed by the peace of Christ, and living as a non-anxious presence in the midst of very anxious times. The children of Israel are on their journey. They have left slavery in Egypt, and they're making their way through 40 years of wilderness wandering, desert wandering, to their land of promise. God has freed them. God has graced them. God has given them the gift of the land of promise. But they're going to have to work hard to make their journey through the wilderness. They're going to have to work hard to possess the gift of the land of promise. So here we catch up with the children of Israel literally in the shadow of Mount Sinai, or as this text refers to it, Horeb. We catch up with them in the shadow of Mount Sinai. They've been making their journey for quite a while at this point. They have seen the mighty acts of God in so many ways. They have recently seen in their lives how God freed them from the bondage in Egypt, how God took them away from Pharaoh, how God sent the plagues there to the Egyptians to help them let God's people go. They witnessed that. They saw that. They saw how God intervened in their lives to free them from slavery and God has led them every step of the way. God has led them by day with a pillar of cloud, by night with a pillar of fire. God led them to the Red Sea, and they thought that would be their end. But God miraculously divided the Red Sea, and God allowed the Israelite people to walk through on dry ground. Can you imagine seeing such a mighty, miraculous act of God. They have already seen God turn bitter water into sweet water. They have seen God provide for their hunger by giving them manna and giving them quail. In so many ways, God has provided for them. In so many ways, God has journeyed with them. But human nature being who we are, sometimes we quickly experience spiritual amnesia. And even though we have seen God do wonderful things in our lives, we get to that circumstance where we think that somehow God can no longer provide. So here on this particular morning, that's related to us in Exodus chapter 17, the children of Israel get up, they go out and they gather up some of that miraculous manna for their meal, but then they cannot find water. And they just simply lose it here according to the text. They start grumbling, they start complaining, they go after 
Moses. And you see here that Moses is a man of prayer. You see here, as you see throughout the book of Exodus, that when Moses didn't know what to do, he turned to God and he prayed. Look here at verse 4. You see that Moses cries out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And Moses was a man of prayer. Moses was a man that lived with great intimacy with God. So God spoke to Moses here in the text. And God said to Moses, go ahead of the people. Take some of the elders of Israel with you. I think he wants those elders of Israel to be his witnesses. Take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go, I will be standing there. God says to Moses, once again in the book of Exodus, God says to Moses, I will be with you. I will be standing there. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it, so that the people may drink. Well, the implication is that Moses did exactly what God told him to do, and water came forth from the rock, and the people's thirst was alleviated. Now, the text also goes on to tell you that this place, this geographical place, was named Massah and Meribah. Massah means place of testing. Meribah means place of complaining, place of testing. The children of Israel were being tested at this point to, to see how faithful they would be, to see how dependent upon God they would be, to see if they could remember the great and gracious provision of God in their lives. So it is Massah, the place of testing. And they were also testing God. They were saying to God, we dare you to provide for us again. We don't think you can. So Massah, place of testing. Meribah, place of complaining. They complained to Moses. They complained about God. They said, Moses, we think you have brought us out here into the wilderness for us to die here. And they're saying, in other words, we would rather be back in Egypt in slavery than be out here free in our wilderness wanderings. There's something remarkable about the human spirit that sometimes we prefer bondage. We prefer, we prefer slavery to that which is known than to the journey that might take us to something that might be new, even if it's God's good, gracious gift to us, even if it is God's great provision for us. They were grumbling. They were complaining. Moses thought that they might just stone him to death. So it's Meribah, the place of complaining. Randy Pausch was a professor of computer science at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. And he was diagnosed, uh, it's about 20 years ago now, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And uh, Professor Pausch actually passed away at age 47 from pancreatic cancer. And you may remember that um, leading up to his death, he, he gave a very inspirational talk. It was, it is titled, The Last Lecture. And I commend it to you. You can still go to YouTube and you can hear Randy Pausch deliver the last lecture. It was a talk that he delivered as he talked about guidance and direction and living life fully and finding the inspiration that you need to live through in difficult times. In the last lecture by Randy, he said this, Complaining does not work as a strategy. We all have finite time and energy. Any time we spend whining is unlikely to help us achieve our goals, and it won't make us happier. 
the last lecture. I commend it to you. He says that complaining does not work as a strategy. Now, I know uh, all of us need those seasons in our life. All of us need those periods in our life where we need to step aside for a while and just have a really good old-fashioned pity party. We all need that from time to time, but we don't want to make a lifestyle out of that. We don't want to make that our life. We here in the United States and Western civilization, it seems like we have, we have made, we have made complaint, we have made complaining into an art form. We've, we have raised being offended into an art form. We've created our whining as almost a new national anthem. We need to be careful because sometimes when we whine, sometimes when we complain, we might have to get to that place by first ridding ourselves of gratitude. Rather than being grateful for what God has done, all of a sudden we find our in a, ourselves in a spot, Messiah, Meribah, where we're complaining about what God seems to not have done for us. I don't know about you, but I know that for me, when when I think about a map of my life and the journey of my life, there are several places on that map that I could mark as Messiah and Meribah. I suspect you can mark some places on your journey too, Messiah and Meribah. You may be in that very place this very morning but maybe the Spirit can call us out of complaining, call us out of grumbling into a spirit of great gratitude where we remember how good God has been to us all along our journey. Hopefully we can get to that place right now that we can say to God, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now because God has been with me throughout the journey and God has been so good to me in so many ways. There actually was a study done at, the, at Stanford University back in 1996 that showed that 30 minutes of complaining or 30 minutes of even being complained to can literally damage our brains. Maybe that's why there's so many brain-damaged people walking around this culture. We, we have control over our attitudes. We have control over the way we respond to circumstances. Here the children of Israel, they had seen the plagues. They had seen God deliver them. They had seen God lead them by a pillar of cloud in the day and a pillar of fire at night. They had seen Moses strike the Red Sea and it divide and they walked through on dry land. They had seen water made out of bitter water. They had seen the gift of quail and manna. But then all of a sudden on this day, they get up and they can't find water and they lose it. They forget. They forget the goodness of God. They've seen miracle after miracle They've experienced provision after provision. And they think that somehow God's gracious store of love and mercy is now depleted. And that somehow God can't provide for them anymore. As we make our journey, we're called to trust. We're called to display radical trust to the world around us. We can trust our unknown future, whatever that may be in our individual lives or our congregation's life. We can trust our unknown future to our very well-known God. We can depend upon the character of God. We can depend upon the nature of God. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, that prince of preachers there in London in the 19th century one time said, as for God failing you, Never dream of it. Hate the thought of it. The God who has been sufficient until now should be trusted to the end. It is God's nature. It is God's nature to keep His promises. My friends, I know that God has provided for us far more than we could ever think or imagine. 
I know that God will continue to provide for us and care for us in remarkable, remarkable ways. I hope that as we worship here in this place on this day, we can feel the great love, the great affection that God has for each one of us. Would you pray with me? God, help us to live as your people in this world. Help us to choose to live differently from the way the world around us tries to force us into living. Help us to trust you. Help us to journey in assurance and confidence that you are our great God and you care for us in ways beyond our imagining. Lord, we want you to to rule and reign in our lives. We want you to cast down all the idols that we have enthroned in our lives so that we can worship and serve you alone. Amen.